We have now Pauline. Her name means little one. Come up, little one. Little small. Anyway. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 to 6. Now this is the crowning point of what we are saying. We have a magnificent king priest who ministers for us at the right hand of God. He is enthroned with honour next to the throne of the majesty on high. He serves in the holy sanctuary, in the true heavenly tabernacle, set up by God and not by men. Since every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so the Messiah also had to bring some sacrifice. But since he didn't qualify to be an earthly priest, and there are already priests who offer sacrifices prescribed by the law, he offered in heaven a perfect sacrifice. The priests on earth serve in a temple that is but a copy modelled after the heavenly sanctuary, a shadow of the reality. For when Moses began to construct the tabernacle, God warned him and said, you must precisely follow the pattern I reveal to you on Mount Sinai. But now Jesus, the, the Messiah, has accepted a priestly ministry which far surpasses theirs since he is the catalyst of a better covenant which contains far more wonderful promises. Thank you, Pauline. I want to just spend a little bit of time in prayer before we get to the Word of God. So I just want to invite you to pray with me. Allow your heart to communicate with the Father's heart this morning. And so, Father, your Word tells us for those who have ears to hear, uh, to listen, and eyes to see, to, uh, to be able to perceive and understand what you're doing. And, Father, these two things I pray for us as a church this morning, that even in this time of message, and Lord, that our eyes will be open, our ears will be open to everything that you want to communicate to us today. For Father, we believe and we are a church that knows that when you communicate something, it's not just for this time. Uh, it's for wherever we head next. It's for the people, Father, that we're going to be involved with. And I want to pray, Father, that today, that as we talk about the revelation of Christ and grace, that grace will be something that continues to leak from your believers right here in this place. Uh, Father, that this church becomes and is known as a place of grace, a place where you can be discovered and you can be found, a place where you can transform and change uh, folk. And I just want to pray, Lord, that we as a church today will be of one heart and one mind uh, in this uh, place of grace and use us for your, your glory and your kingdom. And so, Father, as again, as a church that is on mission every single day of its life, I pray that the things that we hear and we learn today will impact the communities that we are involved with wherever we are. I pray that they'll impact the families that we are involved with. And I pray, Father, they will impact us today. And so, Father, we just declare, may your kingdom come, may your will be done right here today as it's been done in the heavens. And so, Lord, that's just such a, a phrase of expectation. And so, Lord, I pray that we'll be a people who are eager to hear your voice and for it to be poured out upon us as your spirit is today. I thank you for times of worship that we've just come through and, uh, and just the heart of, of what we've been a part of is just your heart. And Lord, we just thank you that you are a God who freely pours out your spirit. And I thank you for the verses that Andrew has used this morning that calls us into our true identity, that we are a royal priesthood, that we are a chosen nation. And Father, that we are family. So Lord Jesus, let your light shine down upon this place today. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I just realised that I told you that the incorrect date is the 18th, but I didn't tell you what the correct date was, which is the 13th. Is that right? That's right, isn't that our 13th? I don't want to do that twice, wrong. And so two wrongs don't make a right. Especially when you eat, laugh and connecting. Um, so come along, I'm sure it will be great. 
I want to talk with you this morning again. It's about grace. And like I said last week, I'm feeling like I'm a bit of a broken record at the moment, but I just want to follow what God is doing and declaring over us that grace is a great thing, yeah? We okay with that? Yes. We're not people of the law, are we? I'm not so sure about that. Why aren't you so sure about that? We are people of grace. And so we declare that the law has been finished. It's completed. In Christ it is now who he is. And so I want to talk a bit about grace and God doing new things. This past week I've been away on a pastor's retreat. Um, and I think I told you guys about that last week. Uh, it's a thing that I lead. There's seven of us that go away and we just hang out at Wombrel Beach. I know, we suffered. I counted the cost. I took one for the team. It was hard. Not at all. Anyway, on Thursday was the last day we were there, and um, each morning, uh, bar one, I got up first thing in the morning, just after sun, sunrise, to walk along the beach, because you don't really get to do that here in Haberfield, do you? You can walk the bay, which is beautiful, but walking the beach is one of my most favourite things to do. It is the place where I feel like I can just really connect with God at such a strong level, and I, I, love, I just love it. I love the beach. Anyway, on Thursday morning, I, I sort of woke up and it was a bit rainy and a bit overcast and I thought, oh, I don't really want to. Uh, and then uh, about 10 minutes later, you thought, well, what have I got to lose? And so I got up and went down the beach and I sat on the beach and just waited. And uh, when I do things like that, I just say, Lord, can you just show me something new today? And uh, so I, I sat there and I, so I watched the, the ocean and all of a sudden this massive whale uh, breaches out of the water, straight vertical and f bang, straight down. There's a few hundred metres in front of me, but I've never seen it in the wild. I've seen it on movies and videos and documentaries. I've seen whales do this sort of thing, but I've never seen a whale come straight up and boom. And you know that moment where you just go, wow, <laughs> I'm so glad I got out of it this morning. <laughs> that was that moment for me. And so when I, and you guys know me a bit by now, so when I see something like that, I just go, well, that's what I've asked for in prayer. So God, what do you want to speak to me now in picture? And so I sat there and I watched and there was about half a dozen of them doing it. And I just couldn't believe I was sitting there watching it. And um, the Lord says, all things new to me. I love that song, but it, it speaks that word over me. Today is a new day, Matt. Something new is occurring. Something new is changing and something new is going to come. And, and so this declaration of all things new and today is a new day is something that I spoke over my day. That's a very positive statement, is it not? Can you speak that out, out over your day today? Just to say, today is a new day. Today is a new day. Yeah, and it's just like, it's a declaration. It's not like, yeah, today is a new day. <laughs> Can you make it a declaration? Like I know Victor can. Can you make it a declaration? Come on. Today is a new day. It's a new day. And we're declaring that and believing that because the Bible not only tells us, but it's now our experience and it's our encounter. Is that helpful? Again, you know that old song that says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me. And that's true, but it becomes an encounter when you receive it. And when you know it, so now it's not just because the Bible tells me, it's because I have been impacted by the love of God, which has changed my life and continues to transform my world. It's a new day. So you get home, and I was, I was on Thursday, and I came back to the house we're staying with, and there's six other pastors, and they say, how was the beach this morning? Did it rain on you? Yes, it rained. That doesn't really bother me. You're at the beach, right? You're going to get wet. <laughs> if it rains, who cares? That's not going to put a downer on my day. I said, I, I just watched whales breaching out of the water. And they've gone, really? They weren't there. I could tell, about, tell them about it. But they weren't there. I watched those whales until they left, so they missed out. I could have run back to the house and said, hey, come down. But I said, no, I just want to be selfish right now. I want this for myself. <laughs> If they wanted to get out of bed early, they could have, but they didn't. So they had to rely on what I said. This morning in this passage of scripture, there's one phrase that really stood out to me. And it was this, that, the, that the old or the law or the copy of the temple was a shadow of the reality that is now. If you look at chapter 9, it would say it's a copy. 
If you look at chapter 10 of Hebrews, it would say again, it's a shadow. And I want to talk to you this morning about what that actually looks like and put it in a practical way so that you can find it helpful and understand how this is a part of how we transform as Christians. So when something is a shadow, a shadow is a symbol of truth, right? But a shadow is always that dark place that is behind you when the sun shines on you. But what, what you see is truth, isn't that right? So in the morning when I get up and I, and I stand on the road and, and I look at my shadow, I'm 20 feet tall. Yes. <laughs> Something that Pauline will never know. So even at sunrise, it's still only one foot tall. Is that right? Oh, okay. Only joking. There's no reason why this can't be fun. Okay, and so the shadow is 20 feet tall. Is that true? Well, it's true because it's a perspective, and so it's a light on me, and, but I'm not actually 20 feet tall, but my shadow is. So there's a truth that's involved in that. And at noon, my shadow is about one foot tall, and that's kind of Pauline's place. But, but, but for me, <laughs> we love truth in this church, right? And so anyway, it's still true because it's the perspective of light upon me, but it's there. Some days I look obese in my uh, shadow. And some days I look ripped. <laughs> Most days. It's all true. I like to believe so anyway. The second part of that, the latter part, right? <laughs> and, and, but it's all perspective. Now, if you saw my shadow and you didn't see me, what's the chances that you're going to pick that that's me? You look at that shadow and that's ripped. That's got to be Matt. Isn't that right? What are you laughing at? <laughs> there should be amens there, not, not laughter. It's all good. Yeah, we want truth, that's right. How would you be able to see that it's me by just looking at a shadow? So often as Christians, we live in the place of shadow instead of coming to the place of Christ. If you go back to the Old Testament, you've got the children of Israel when they come to Mount Sinai with Moses. And it's so scary and so frightening up there. They say to Moses, you go up there and talk to God and you tell us what he says and that's cool. So what the Israelites are doing are staying in a place of shadow because they don't want to come to a place of revelation with God. And so what happened in Israel's history is they kept hearing from Moses and they would then weigh up whether that's true. And so like my story of the whales on, on Wombrel Beach, you could hear that story and you can weigh up if that's true or not, but you're hearing it. You weren't actually there, so you're just hoping that what Matt's saying is, is a reality and it and is a truth. But if you were there, if you were there, you'd be standing with me and going, did you see that? Could you see that? There's another one over there. And you're there in that place of revelation. Why? Because you've come out of the place of just wanting to hear about it. You want to see it with your own eyes. Amen? That's the place where God is calling us to today. Outside the shadows and to the place of truth. And so Israel, time and time and time again, would hear what God would say. And they'd say, well, we've got a better idea. So God would come along and say, you don't need a king. I am your king. And if you follow after me, I will continue to provide for you. They go, hearing what you're saying, Samuel, still want a king. They're staying in the place of shadow. In this scripture that we're looking at in Hebrews chapter 8, it starts off by saying, this is the crowning point of what I've got to say. Or well, this is the main point, it might say in your, your version. Now, when the Bible says things like that, it's like, please, if you're not going to listen to anything else, just listen to this. Paul uses a word, so Paul didn't write Hebrews, but he uses a word, therefore. Every single time you see therefore in Scripture, it's Paul saying, because of everything I've said there, this is now the reason. This is the purpose. This is what I'm bringing it to being. So if you're a scholar, this is where your summary actually lies. And so here in Hebrews chapter 8, right in the middle of the book of Hebrews, the writer says, this is the main point. And you've got to get this. 
And he's calling them to this. And so the next three chapters is him making this main point again and again and again because he does not want us to drift away from it. He wants us to come out of the shadows and into the place of light. He wants us to understand exactly what Andrew spoke over us this morning, that we are a royal priesthood. Yeah? We are a holy nation. We are a chosen people. We are royalty in the kingdom. You are not a lesser brother. You are not a lesser sister. You are my brother. You are my sister. And God doesn't differentiate between the two. Often we do. We do because of our behaviour. We do because we look at a person and go, well, they never tell us the truth and that's where we put them down so that we can lift ourselves up. And then the normal structure of things in our lives, we have a lesser brother because we think less of them. Jesus goes, that's just not the way I work. It's not the way I, I work. So here in this scripture, God is saying to us, I have done a new thing in Christ. The old thing is now done. It's finished. And like I said last week, it's got this DNR written over the law, which means do not resuscitate it. Do not bring it back to life. We are people who live in grace. We do not live in law. Yeah? yeah. So the law is done. It's dead. It's still, you can still read the Old Testament. It's still awesome. But it's not our mechanism for getting us to God. Our mechanism, if I can even say that about Jesus, is Him. His desire for us. His sacrifice for us. His desire to be in relationship with us all happens through Jesus. It doesn't happen through our behavior. It happens through our faith. Law happens through our behaviors. Faith and grace happen through Christ. Yeah? yeah. We okay with that? And so what happens, though, as Christians is we keep drifting back to places of law because we think, well, that's the way I was raised and we like the black and white and we like to live in a place of contract. So just tell me what is right and just tell me what is wrong and I'm just going to do what is right. How many times has that worked out for humanity? None. Exactly right. None. So for 6,000 years, it's not worked out for humanity. Why are we still trying to do it? I don't know. But Jesus goes, there's a new way. There's a new path, which is now the only path. You know when you go to buy a car and the car salesman says, here's the, here's the base model, that's cool. Uh, just for a few dollars more, you might like to get the tinting. <laughs> and if you get the tinting, that will take 15% of your UV rays and make sure you don't get cancer. And then for a few dollars more, you might like to get the GPS. And the GPS will make sure you never get lost. And then for a few dollars more, you can get the reversing camera, which makes sure you don't roll over any toys or anything in the driveway and stuff like that. Because so that's, that's where you keep your toys, right? And, and, and so for a few dollars more. And, and so what you walk out with is a lot poorer than what you walked in with because your expectation was to spend this, but you've been talked into doing that. And Jesus comes along and says, you know what, it's not about the law being the base model, then we've added Jesus into it. Because if you've got the law and you've got Jesus together and you try and put those two things together, what you have is split personality Christians. Because you have people trying to live it one way and you've got the same person trying to live it another way and you get confused because you think, well, I've got to do it this way because the Bible says I've got to do it that way and the Old Testament tells me I've got to do it that way if I want a relationship with God. But Jesus comes along and says in grace, you can actually let that go and I'm confused because that's the way I've grown and that's the way I do my things and that's the patterns of my life. But now Jesus is saying I've got a new way. It's no longer about your behavior. It's about how much I love you. And it's always about that, but you guys kind of got confused with it. And so now through Christ, this new thing has occurred where he is saying you no longer have to be split personality. You can now live in this place of understanding a relationship with the Father purely by, the what, by what you believe. Who's up for that? And so when we live in places of law, we do things like this. We start judging people. And we start judging people in a way of saying, well, that's not why I would have done it. And so when we judge people, we eventually want to punish a person. And so that's the way of law. We, we go down right and wrong. But Jesus comes along and says, but I've forgiven that person. 
And all of a sudden, this complexity starts happening in our two belief systems that we want to live in this place of contract, but Christ is calling us in this place of grace. And we get confused, and then we start reading the Bible, and we go, well, God, what is the truth? And here he is saying to us, you've got to get yourself out of the old and understand that a relationship with him in the new will start changing your life. In the last eight days of my life, now let me give you a bit of context, and so most of you guys know, we're closing down our preschool. It's a very difficult thing to do in a community. We believe it's the right thing to do. We believe with all the other competition that's around us right now, and it's such a complex thing to run an early childhood centre now. Uh, so that, but there's so much stress and tension with that because we've got people in the community who are upset. We've got uh, people having to look for other places. We've got staff that are retrenching. And, and, and so my whole internal mechanism of my world is so stressed at times that you just go, God, I just want to get out of that place. But at the same time, in the last eight days, so I've done this. So eight days ago, I was at Spirit and Grace, uh, which last Saturday night, and I think I shared that with you guys last Sunday morning, was this amazing time of just entering into God's presence and encountering Him. And there I'm leading worship, and I've got Zach playing drums, and here's Bethany singing such beautiful songs over a whole community of believers. And it didn't matter if they were Baptist or Pentecostal or Catholic or whatever it was, we're all there. And there's an encounter with God. And so the next day was Sunday, and we're here at church, and it was such a great day Sunday. And I want to say thank you to you guys who texted or emailed through the week just to say what a great service it was, and that's so encouraging for me. But you see God at work in the lives of the hearts of, your, of our people who are right here in this place. And then I go away on retreat on Sunday afternoon, and I spend four days on, on Wombrel Beach. And like that's pretty amazing too. But all of that is going on inside of me, which is blessing and sounds great. And, I, and you say, I'd love to be doing that. And I say, that's cool, but you've got to do both things. You can't just do one thing. So you've got to walk through the valley if you want to stand on top of mountains too. And here is God showing to me, Matt, you're not actually standing on mountains. I'm actually walking with you through the dark valley. And even in that place, he's showing me the quality of the grace that he brings and tells me and shows to me when I start drifting back into places of law. Places of judgment, places of condemnation, places of bondage. And in that place, he gets me to cry out over my life, it is a new day. It is a new day. And I was coming back to Haverfield on Thursday. I was coming back into a place where there's lots of anxiety and stress for me. But it is on that day that he calls me to cry out over my day that it is a new day. And he calls me to believe in it and have faith in it. And I have discovered in faith and in grace, I have this relationship with Jesus that allows me to let go of the law and to live in the place of grace. And I discover this new covenant that we are hearing in the church this morning is far better than the one that was old. It is now new. It is now here and it is now accessible only through Christ the great high priest the one who was always going to come plan A of what God was doing is now here and he's crying out to us to come and to follow this new pattern that he calls grace it's so easy for us to follow the old patterns of the past. We've been doing it for so many years. Isn't that right? And when you do it repetitively for 40-something years, it becomes a very strong pattern and it's very easy to, to go back into the ruts and just do that. And just, just because it's kind of worked, I'll just do that. But there is Jesus saying, I'm actually, there's no ruts on his road. His road, the thing that with his road, his word lights the road beneath my feet. That's what the Bible says. And so if I'm listening to his word, if I'm following his revelation, his light is enough to show me that the next step is going to be something that he's going to guide me through. And it's in faith I'm taking those steps. And I know in faith I get the Lord's pleasure is over me. And in faith I can let go of the past knowing that he will provide for me, knowing that he will protect me, knowing that he will deliver me, knowing that I'll do and fulfill the purpose that God has for my life. And it comes from you just going, you know what, today I've got to get out of the shadows. You know how often I talk about spirit and grace here? I've heard people say to me this, I, th I think, Matt, you might be overselling it. <laughs> That's cool. 
You can think that. But if you're not there, you won't know. Uh, I can tell you how good church was last Sunday morning. But if you're not there, you won't know. I can tell you how good a, a retreat is with, with six other pastors. Uh, if you're not there, you don't know. If you've been away on a men's retreat with me, which many of you guys have, um, what we do on men's retreat is exactly what I do on pastor's retreat, so I model it. So if you've been away on a men's retreat, you know what I'm saying is truth. You've got to come out from the shadow to reveal and see God for who he is. So in the New Testament, um, Jesus is constantly asked, what is the kingdom of heaven actually like? Okay, so he's been there, right? So that he would say things like this. The kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of immense value. And a pearl merchant's looking for it. And when that pearl merchant actually finds it, he sells everything he's got and he buys that pearl. Or the kingdom of heaven is like, like the yeast that, that a woman will, will knead into the dough and that yeast will spread to all things. Or the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that is found planted in a field. And when the guy finds that treasure, he goes and sells everything he's got so that he can buy that field for where that treasure is. Or the kingdom of heaven is something like a fishing net that gets cast out and all these fish get brought in and then the fish is sorted out or well, the kingdom of heaven is, is like a Pharisee who comes to God and he discovers the truth that's in God and he is a person who can bring truth from both the new and from the old. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And so here's Jesus saying this. And so in their minds, they're trying to get this. They're trying to understand this. And, and the disciples come to Jesus and they go, well, I'm not really understanding that, Jesus. I'm not really getting that, Jesus. Why? Because they're still in the shadows now. What's the common denominator in every one of those stories? The one who told the story. He is the common denominator. The truth of the matter is the kingdom of heaven was right in front of them, but they were looking for it in other places. Every part of the kingdom of heaven was discovered in Jesus, whether he spoke it out or he did not. The kingdom of heaven was seen in him reaching down to a leper. The kingdom of heaven was seen in him giving sight back to the blind. The kingdom of heaven was found at the bottom of a tree looking up to Zacchaeus. The kingdom of heaven was found when Nicodemus knocked on his door. The kingdom of heaven was found when he was being flogged and beaten. The kingdom of heaven was found when he was on a cross. The kingdom of heaven was found when he was raised from the dead. The problem was people were looking for other things and they're not looking at the one they should be looking at and the ones that did receive the blessing. Do you remember what Jesus said to Thomas when Thomas wanted to see and understand and when, Je when Jesus came in and said to Thomas, here's my hands, here's my side, Jesus says to Thomas, blessed are you, but even more blessed are those who have not seen, but they still believe. They have come to a place of faith through grace. They've been able to let go of the old and know that that is now done. And in Christ, we have this mechanism of love and connection to the Father in heaven. It is the only way. It is the way that we have found as a body of believers. And it is the way now that we lead others to. Yeah? Amen? Come out of the shadows, my friends, and into the light. So here, the reality of the, of the shadow was that they were kind of thinking that's what God was like. But it's like looking for me and my shadow and discovering who that is. You can kind of see that it's probably a person. And if it was a today, you might see that I had a long sleeve shirt on. If you look really hard at the shadow. And so maybe it's a guy. If you're just looking at the shadows and not coming to the one, then all you're going to be doing is guessing at who God is. Next Sunday night, when I lead this encounter downstairs, I want to invite you to see the one. How cool would that be? Not get, just guess about him. Uh, because I believe in a God who walks beside me, even through the darkest times. I believe in a God who provides. I believe in a God who loves. I believe in a God who wants to be known. The Bible says, if I seek for him, I'll find him. And I believe in that word with all of my heart, my soul, and my spirit. And the next Sunday night, if that's what you want to do, uh, I want to encourage you to come out and, and be led into a place of encounter. Come out of the shadows. 
and see Christ for who he actually is. I want to close this morning in prayer. I kind of want to get the team to sing that song that you started with, This Is Amazing Grace. And I'm just going to stand down the front here. If you, got, if you want to just say, you know what, I'm tired of the shadow, and you want to come and stand with me, I want to encourage you to do so. Make a stand to say, like coming to the front of a church doesn't save you, doesn't make you any closer to God or anything like that. You're already close to him. Why? Because he's inside of you. I'm not sure how much close you want to be. He's actually inside of you. But coming to the front and allowing that statement of faith to be made lets the whole world know that this is what you're on about, what you're being called to, and to say, you know what, I've been living too long in a reality that I'm just guessing at, and today I want to live in the reality of who Christ is. Let me just pray. Father, I just want to thank you for words of scripture like this. And I reckon, Father, at times I know that I'm a slow learner. That I can read these words and reread these words and reread these words and still miss the fact that you want a relationship with me. And so, Father, today I, I pray for your people right here in this room. I'm wondering whether this is true or... I want to pray, Father, that today, right now, Jesus, that you walk into this room and just allow your presence to rest on your people. Allow them to encounter your presence today. Let's not wait for next Sunday night. Father, I want to pray that for your church this very day, the encounter will happen today, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, right through to Sunday. And so that when we get back here on Sunday, that we can be praising God, praising you for the way that you have revealed yourself to us. God, you are a God who reveals. And today, Father, I pray that you've revealed something more of your grace, something more of your love, something more of your transformative power that is here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done for me. So this morning, just these four guys that have come to the front, Victor, I declare over your day, it is a new day. Do you receive that? Colin, I declare over you today, this is your new day. Do you receive that? Karen, this is your new day. Do you receive it? And Ashley, this is a new day, my friend. The Lord is going to do a great work through you. You have a heart of capacity. I've only just met you, but I know that the Spirit of God is on you. May the Lord himself inspire you to greater things than you've seen yet. May the Lord himself show you his presence on the path that you walk with him, beside him, and you are becoming like him. You are like Christ. Karen, may the Lord today fill you with joy. I really believe, Karen, that you carry a lot of joy. And I pray, Father, that today the joy of the Lord will not only be your strength, but you will leak it. When people hang out with you, they'll feel joy. Colin, you yourself, you have a, a long history of wisdom. But I just want to declare over you there is a new season that you are walking into where the Spirit of God is going to increase the capacity of your heart. You are a compassionate man. The Lord sees it. The Lord knows it. And the Lord is expanding your capacity to love. Victor, uh, you have a, yeah, you're a friend, right? You're a friend of God. And I pray for you, Victor, through all the things that you have walked through in your life and you've journeyed together, that there are, yeah, the Lord is going to give you sight to see and ears to hear. And so, Father, I pray that you'll put him into a season that he's in. I know he's in that season of learning and growing. And so, Father, um, yeah. 
Reveal yourself to him in a new way today. Father, I pray for us as a church, a vessel of grace, a home of grace, a place of rest where we declare over this place, God, make yourself at home right here. Make yourself at home with your people. You used to walk with Adam in the cool of the night. Tonight, Father, walk with us in the cool of this evening. Father, teach us to communicate with you in a greater way where we can know you as Father God or even in the Greek, Papa, Dad. May we just go to those places of relationship, of of knowledge that we are favoured sons and daughters by our behaviour but by our faith so Lord today continue your great work amongst us and fill us with grace maybe we could just finish by singing this is amazing grace the chorus can we just do that and I want to do it big can we do it big maybe let's pick it up from the bridge worthy is the lamb what a great truth that is from scripture let's join with the angels right now who are around the throne singing that very phrase let's join with an an eternity amen amen father in heaven send us out now with that same joy that we feel in this room take us downstairs let's enjoy good coffee and just good friendship and fellowship let's enjoy love We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on downstairs.